Hello and welcome to Morning Coffee and Maestros. Today's topic is called Conductor, Magician or Musician. <laughs> Magicians often wear a tuxedo, so do maestros. The magician wields a magic wand while the conductor waves his or her magical baton. While conductors do occasionally pull a rabbit out of our hat during a concert week, we've done that, <laughs> it is really the musicianship and the musician who creates the magic. So what are the skills that make a conductor great? How does one go from merely beating time to shaping and inspiring and, and interpretation? What are the steps that we take from study to rehearsal to performance to hopefully a standing ovation? Hopefully a standing ovation. And we hope you'll be part of the conversation. Ask us your burning musical questions. You can do this by adding a comment on Facebook or by using the live chat function on YouTube. We'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as we can during this episode. And of course, my dog chewed up my, uh, my shoelaces, so I'm going a little bit barefoot. To, not completely barefoot. I've got some pretty cool They are pretty fairly cool. cool. I, I did notice that uh, <laughs> they did look a little bit like hobo shoes now. <laughs> <laughs> my, my congregation is used to the, to the stocking feet, they call. So I have like 200 pairs of socks because they all wow. like to buy me socks. Anyway, before we jump in, Key Carell has been extremely busy with the launch of our new season titled Come Together. There are a number of ways you can experience amazing performances right from the safety of your own computer, tablet, or phone. All of our performances will have an online version, so you can be part of this amazing season no matter where you live. That's right, and there's still time to be part of our Come Together Choir Online Choral Rehearsals Volume 2. If you, like many of us, are missing singing, these online rehearsals will really help fill that void. It helps dust off the cobwebs. A lot of us haven't been singing much since it started, and it'll just make you feel good. So if you haven't participated yet, you still can. Just go to the website, our website at keycorral.org, to register. We'll send you the music, and you can learn 11 songs with us. And it's great fun, and even, if, even though we're four or five weeks into it, you can start right with Lesson 1 and even catch up with us. So I hope you'll be part of the Come Together Choir. And we're also excited about our encore presentation of American Roots, The Gospel Experience. The Gospel Experience is a collaboration of Key Corral and West Coast Black Theater Troupe exploring the rich traditions of black gospel music in America. This is and was an extremely high energy show that celebrates the deeply emotional music at the heart of African American worship. You can purchase your ticket, $25 per household, now until November 1st. That's right, and we are excited too because we're having our first online streaming concert of the season, and it's titled, Together We Rise, Celebrating the Resiliency of the Human Spirit, and I think we have a very fancy photo to show. We might see it. It premieres October, 20, uh, Oct uh, October 30th, my fault, at 7.30 p.m. and will be available through November 22nd. So it's going to be a very exciting concert. We're recording tonight. We're excited about that, and it is going to be stupendous. What were your thoughts? You know, it's the whole dynamic of, of COVID has really shifted things a lot, and it's been an extreme pleasure and fun um, even though the whole chorale can't get together right now, to be able to have the chamber singers get together, socially distant, wearing masks, um, I think it's a testament to other choirs around the country of, of, of possibilities that they can explore. Um, and this, this concert that we're doing, I think, is just going to be one that um, gets to each person's niche. I think anyone who watches this yep. concert, there might not be something in it. It might not be everything they love, but I feel like there'll be something that everybody of all age groups will, will love about this concert and will learn to appreciate all types of, of music. And it just gets right to the soul of where we are in our country right now, where we are in our own lives right now. And I think that this really is, you know, the balm of, of, of our country is, is music is that healing, healing thing that we need. And um, I think as musicians, this is kind of our way of saying, don't give up on us. Um, <laughs> we have a way of getting music to you, but we know this won't be forever. At some point, you'll be able to return to the concert hall. So I'm, I'm extremely excited about uh, this concert we're doing. We are too. We're recording it tonight, and it's at Church of the Redeemer. It's a beautiful place. 
the acoustic is great. And what I think is really nice about this, you and I, we did some sort of MC intros to all these pieces, so you get to hear a little bit about the, the history of the pieces, why they're significant, and also you're going to be able to see close-ups that you'd never get if you're in the concert hall. So we're trying to True. make it even uh, more interesting than it would be. You're yeah. going to be essentially right in there with the choir singers, but it's great music, and I, I'm with you. Uh, um, the music and the text really spoke to me and have given me a sense of healing. Um, and I, th I know it will for everyone else at home. And I think the cool thing about this concert is it brings a, I think, a, a cooler element to the pre-concert lecture. Yeah, like the pre-concert talk is happening throughout the concert, so you continuously have context as to what's happening versus just coming to the pre-concert talk before and then listening to the concert. So, so we encourage you to do that. That's, uh, $30 per household, and you can view it from October 30th through November 22nd, and I guarantee you, you'll enjoy it, and you can do that from anywhere in the country, which is great. Do you but have that picture of us? I, I really I know, want to see that picture. We look pretty, uh, pretty debonair. Okay, we don't have it. We don't have that. Forget the picture. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Oh, there it is. <laughs> see, we're having as much fun as we are now. <laughs> so <laughs> these are, when we were recording the uh, pre-concert, and I don't, I think I probably had a swear word because Jamal is really <laughs> laughing there, but uh, you know how it is. You, you, there's many takes before we get the right one. It is true. <laughs> so today we're talking about the art of conducting, but since no one comes out of the womb in a tux, batoned in hand and ready to conduct, we thought we'd show you some of our photos before we were conductors. So I think these are going to be somewhat adorable, somewhat embarrassing. Oh, that's all right. So show us what we have. All right, well, mine are adorable. All right, so uh, I'll kind of talk you through these. This is, uh, this is my first uh, major concert. It was right out in the, uh, early in the morning on the front porch. Um, beautiful sort of a day. I'm wearing my dad's shoes. I hadn't quite grown into them yet. And uh, singing, uh, uh, I'm sure, a pretty terrible song. And what do, we, what do we have for the next one? Oh, there I am oh. with my dad. So now I'm, uh, now I'm with my dad instead of just in his shoes. It's my dad, James. You guys look exactly alike. I know. And this one. Oh, oh yes. I'm telling you. This one, uh, uh, our photographer for Key Corral, Peter Acker, said it looks like you're being attacked by an atlas <laughs> butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is about right. I lost my tooth there. And, uh, you know, if you're gonna be, it's, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of pattern going on there. Um, there's that look in your eye, which probably led me to conducting because I couldn't be trusted any other way. <laughs> the next one, um, you know, I had an infatuation with Evo Knievel, and conducting is kind of like that. It's, it's just a daredevil kind of moment. I like how the, there's, a, there's two faces to Evo Knievel, apparently. You know, you've, got, you've got my own face and then the face on top, but, uh, you know, there's no, no sense that conducting can be a little bit like Evo Knievel. <laughs> All right, what else do we have here? Oh, here you go. This is... Uh, so I grew up in a family of uh, a family uh, musicians. They all played in dance bands. This is uh, Johnny Starr and his All Stars. Johnny Starr is my grandfather on the left. My grandma at the drums. She was the the first uh, female drummer uh, in the 50s in Iowa. She was called Connie, the sweetheart of the drums. Wow. And I mostly had this one because I've never seen such a large banjo player. I don't know who that is, but <laughs> that is pretty awesome. So we all kind of grew up in the family band. And here's another. Uh, here's one of the early family bands. Um, it's my Uncle Jerry on the, on, uh, the left, and in the center is my Uncle Jim. Um, we all had strange names, Jerry Joe and Jimmy John, for reasons I can't <laughs> explain. And uh, I didn't know it then, but I, I was the drummer. You can see me in that little, I guess I'm ready to go on some nautical <laughs> adventure. Uh, <clears throat> but I was playing the drums, and it reminds me of the connector joke, where if you have a, a, a kid who's not very talented, you give him two sticks and make him play the drum. And if that doesn't work, you take one away and make him the conductor. So, all right, here's the next one. What else do we have here? Oh, I was a saxophone player, and uh, kind of like Jamal, I'm barefoot. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was an alto sax player growing up, and apparently I'm, I'm playing in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> and what's next? Uh, this is, this is uh, our family. So rarely do we have an opportunity to get together and just sing and play together. So my dad is in the back uh, playing rhythm guitar, my mom on the organ. She looks like she's a lot more focused <laughs> than anyone else. She must be doing something complicated. But, so that's kind of the family band and the way we grew up. So do we have some of Jamal's stuff now? Or are we still no? I guess not. <laughs> there they are. Here we go. Well. Nice. That's me in my, <laughs> my little kente outfit. 
I, I cannot believe how tiny of a baby I was, but I've always had a big head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And that's, that is me as an artist. I, I assumed that I would be an artist when I grew up. Always uh, with a hat. Always with a hat. I don't know what it... Maybe that's why I hate wearing hats now, is because my mom <laughs> always had me in hats as a baby. But even from then, I had a baton in my hand. <laughs> this was when I uh, had contemplated being a quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. They could have um, used you. They could have. They really <laughs> could have used me this season. Uh, so that's Christmas time. And that's me and my cousins on New Year's. Nice, another hat. I like another that. Another hat. Another hat. <laughs> Jeez, I didn't even think about how many hats I had. But I've always had a baton in my hand. Oh. And I loved fudge sickles. And they are pretty tasty. Somehow this picture came about. My cousin took this of me mid suck on my fudge sickle. You look but... like you're really enjoying it. You know, <laughs> eyes are closed, like I'm going to take every last. Yeah. But I loved fudge sickles. So all of that. Led to, do you have the next pictures? All of that led to this was one of my first major conducting opportunities. Uh, That's a great shot. And that is of the first major choral orchestral piece I did, and that was Mozart's Requiem. That's right. Don't uh, mess with this guy. Yeah, he got I, it together. I was, I was, I was <laughs> on my stuff then. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, there is a, process of of the conductor um, from score studying you know there it, it interests me how many conductors some you know Marion Alsop is is one of those conductors who actually practice her gestures in the mirror um, and you know you think as a young conductor you think that's just something you do for your lessons but um, it actually is a great technique because you actually get to see what everyone else is seeing. Um, and what I used to do was um, I would record my conducting lessons. Um, and usually at my conducting lessons there was a pianist. Um, and going back to being able to see me, I'm just like, man, that was a stupid gesture. Mm -hmm. Man, my face looks I'm about to punch somebody in the <laughs> face during this beautiful little section. <coughs> But what are we doing when we are up on the podium? <laughs> you know, what, what, what is it that we're doing? Well, I think uh, the big thing what I think about is conducting it at, the, at its, its purest form is communication. It's mm. a form of communication. And everything we do is about communicating with the orchestra, the singer, um, the chorus, whatever it might be. And I think um, so many times we look at the gesture, which is one way. We communicate with, like you said, with our, with our facial expression, with our, the way we hold our body. Everything that a conductor does, if they do it well, has an ability to elicit a different response from the ensemble. And, um, you know, what I think is, like, you know, a lot of times we just beat time. We do our little four pattern. And it's, you know, you can do a little four pattern till, you're, till, you're, till the cows come home. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's kind of as you say, you know what, maybe I'll do that four pattern. But, you know, that third beat is really important. I might give that a little bit of nuance. And you say, well, that's great, but maybe I want to do that second beat has a little bit of something. So you, changes you can make. If you've got a, you want something a little bit more steady, you can do that. If you want something more legato, you can change the. So all of this has all been going on in the pattern, but there's just an infinitesimal amount of ways that you can use your hands to express. But it's not just the hands. The hands have to be connected to the shoulders, to the face, and all of that. And I, and I think so many times in conducting, um, what the audience sees and what they really like are the showboating gestures, mm -hmm. the really excitable gestures that are really crazy. And, and I, I detest conductors that do that because they're not serving the music, they're serving themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes, you know, some will say, wow, did you love that conductor? And I'll say, well, I was watching what they were doing technically, and no, I didn't. Um, and I think so many times I th when I think about my conducting, I think, am I doing something that's suitable to the music? Am I doing something that serves the musicians, the instrumentalists? the singers, all of that. And I think that's the most important part because it's not just, it's not just a matter of, of showing your gesture. It's a matter of conveying concepts. And I think a lot of times you're talking about um, doing things in a mirror. And when I was younger, I did that all the time. Uh, eventually, I started doing less and less of that. And now I'll go and I'll look at the mirror for something specific. Is there mm -hmm. some kind of an articulation that I want or some way I want to do it? And a lot of times we've been doing so much video work now yep. For good or bad reason, I get to watch myself a lot more than I want. And yep. so you kind of see some of those um, 
habits that we have that are maybe not good and the habits that are good, and you just kind of keep refining them. But I think um, to not look in a mirror, I think you're losing an opportunity to see some of those things. But by the same token, there are conductors that rehearse their gesture, and that's the gesture they do in the performance. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, that's great, but sometimes you have to just listen to what you're being given, and that elicits a different response. So I think it's a matter of, of yeah. just being aware of how important gesture is. Yeah. One of the things that I love is, uh, you know, a lot of times an ins you're cueing instrumentalists, you're giving a cue here and a cue there. And I like how uh, one of my teachers said, you know, my job as a conductor is not to tell you when to come in, but how to come in, which changes it. Yeah. So what, what are your thoughts about gesture and how it applies to conducting? Um, one of the things that I, I think it's just, it's, it's my overall countenance. My, my, my wife calls me pessimistic. Um, <laughs> and I don't see myself as pessimistic. And she says that's what pessimistic people say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I have always, you know, I like to have fun. I like to laugh. But one of the things is, is when I'm, when I'm approaching music, um, I generally come to it with one personality. That was how, that was really the foundations of my early conducting. Um, and I mean, I'm still early conducting, but I think just always coming with seriousness and coming with kind of just this really serious face. Um, and, you know, I could be, I could be conducting, you know, something fun, something exciting. Um, and it's just this really serious face. And my conducting professor, she just said, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the, the beating that you need to work on. It's not even the gestures or how you relate. It's your, your orchestral or choral sound often sounds the way your face looks absolutely um and that really helped me in approaching music just from the beginning of score studying like there there are times in my scores where i will i will write in um smile um you know make sure your face isn't so stern um, watch your body language. One of the, one of the biggest things that um, greatly improved with my conducting teacher was, um, and it's just because I walk with a hunch sometimes, right. I never really yep. stand up straight, um, is that, you know, I was clear as day as a conductor, but just kind of was here in this box. Mm -hmm. And m a professor of mine, who, my conducting professor, told me, that you have the body, you have the you have the the width of 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 a conductor. Like many conductors wish that they could just stand up straight and do something very minimalist and get the same response. Right, sure. You know, my this conducting <coughs> professor was five foot three oh, wow. and really skinny, so he had to do a lot more. And he's just like, you don't have to do much. He's like, if you just if you just open yourself up, the sound will automatically open. And he's like, if you just don't look like you're freaking pissed at the world, the sound will automatically will yeah, exactly. open up. So I think even more than, than this or this, it's, it's, the, it's the body language and it's the face that really, um, I think, shows the color um, of, of what you're wanting to do as a conductor. I think you're right, because I, I, I feel like my hands are enhancing what I'm doing facially, mm. and I focus more on my face, and I think a lot of times, and I don't even know how you explain it, but you become like a, uh, a Jedi mind trick specialist, <laughs> because you can look at a, 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 a person and, and you can communicate something, I don't know how that happens, but you can just look into their eyes, and I just think, when I think intentionally about what I'm trying to communicate, uh, more of that's happening with my face, the way I use my eyes, um, there's so much that happens, and that's why I'm a terrible. I'm terrible at lying. So <laughs> Michelle, my wife, had to always call and uh, call me in sick because I couldn't do it. They could they could see my expressions on the phone, but it's uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so they can you can kind of read that book. But I think that's where it's so important that um, you know when I was younger, I was I was similar in that way that I was so serious because I'm working on my craft. But it got took me a while to get comfortable enough to to realize that my hands in this case are supporting 
what I'm doing physically and, mm -hmm. and with my face. And, and I even notice in, uh, you know, that just by furrowing your brows, the sound of a choir changes. Just by opening it up, the sound changes. Mm -hmm. so, so I think what's great is you start to use all of these things, your hands, your body, and your face, to be able to create an illicit sound and communicate. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, well, this is me, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm supposed to do that, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the next question, we kind of allude a little bit to it. Is one of the questions comes from Bryce Jones, one of our chamber singers, who says, um, what's the difference in conducting an orchestra versus conducting a chorus? So there are some technical differences, I would say, but I would say a conductor is a conductor is a conductor. Um, if you, as a conductor, do not feel comfortable in front of both a chorus and orchestra, <coughs> don't get on the podium. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you cannot, um, you know, the thing that distinguishes orchestras from, from, from saying this person's a conductor and just calling them a choral conductor is the fact that um, when you do a choral orchestral masterpiece, who are, you, who are you dealing with the whole time? Are you just dealing with the chorus? Mm -hmm. Or if you're conducting a choral orchestral work and you're just dealing with the orchestra, um, that says something about you as well. I think the way you approach score study between choral and orchestral is very different. Um, you know, versus four to eight parts um, you know, with orchestral conducting, you're talking about 20 to 30 different parts plus. Um, and so your focus really is, you know, outside of the strings is you've got a whole wind, brass ensemble, percussion ensemble um, that you actually have to focus on with, with I don't want to just cue you, but I want to show you what I want your entrance to sound like. Um, so there, there are some technical differences between orchestral um, and choral conducting, and I think just even in the area of, of score study. Um, but I, I believe that anyone who is a conductor um, and wants to make a profession out of being a conductor, if they are not well versed in the, on the podium between both ensembles, uh, then they should step off. And I, and I don't mean this in the, the church realm or just like specific realms. I mean this in the professional conducting realm. If you cannot hold your own with being able to conduct both um, very well, express what you need to, yeah, your gestures tend to, tend to change a little bit. Um, you know, I would say with, with choral conducting, you can get away more from getting away from the gesture than you can with orchestral conducting. Um, but if you are, condu if you're orchestral conducting, you don't always have to beat time. Exactly. Sometimes you can <coughs> trust the players to, to know what they're doing and you can shape the same you do with, with the choir. Um, so that, that's kind of how I feel. I, I really believe that a true conductor, um, should be able to step into an opera pit, should be able to step in front of an orchestra, should be able to step in front of a chorus. Um, yes, I don't think all orchestras can speak choral, orchestra conductors can speak choral language, um, but a good conductor would learn how to. Absolutely. Um, if, they, if they're primarily a, an orchestral conductor. Yeah, I think um, when I think about, I think you're right, a conductor is a conductor is a conductor. And it's just knowing the subtleties. I, I know it's interesting for me, <clears throat> and this is not a uh, criticism of choirs, but once it's just orchestra, my job gets way easier. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, you know, I can communicate in a different way on a higher level sometimes than when I've got a group of 70, 80, 100 people. Um, it's just a little, it changes the dynamic of what you're able to do. And I think the other thing that's different is, um, uh, George Sell used to say, we want, I want my orchestra to sing and my chorus to play. And what he meant by that was, um, orchestras are really great at articulation, all those things, but we always say to the strings, that needs to sing, it needs to be cantabile, can it be more beautiful, mm -hmm. more singing? And with our, with our singers, um, a choir is a very legato instrument. It just is very, very um, 
overtly smooth, and the more we can get them to be accurate with, with, uh, with timing, with synchronization, with rhythm, all those things, it makes it clearer. But, and I think from a gesture standpoint, there are subtle differences, but they're very subtle. Um, you know, I, a lot of times when I'm with a choir and a small forces, I don't use a baton. You know, the reason I use a baton generally for orchestra stuff is generally it's harder to see me. I'm further away. Sure. Um, and, but even the gesture you use with a baton is different than the gesture, or can be different than the gesture you use your hands. What I like about um, only working with singers from a gesture is I can, I can use um, gestures that I would never use with an orchestra that helps sure. with the language of what they're doing. So there's lots of things that are different, but they're very, they're very minute. And I, yeah. and I know for a young conductor, the worst thing you can do is do, your, do a choral orchestral conductor in your first four comments or the choir, because then the orchestra says, well, I'm just going to play. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of part of it. So it's, I think that's one of those things that is, is uh, it looks like there's a lot of difference, but I, the, the great conductors are great at either, either place. So before we even step on the podium, uh, there is quite a bit of work that needs to be done. Um, so to you, what does, what does score study really mean? And, and sort of, we can kind of go back and forth and, and talk about both of our processes. And I think we both sort of share, um, you know, a lot of what I do comes from the Hillis um, mm -hmm you know, portion of, of, of score studying, but what really is score studying? And, and maybe we can talk about the, the process as well. I think so too, because I know for detectors, we throw out score study, and I know for a lot of people, they probably go, they have an idea of what that is, but maybe not the, <clears throat> the level of what that is. And so I think from a score study standpoint, what I think about is I go from the macro stuff to the micro, and then I go back to the macro. So when I mean macro, I'm looking at the very start, starting of a piece is saying, well, it, you know, what's the composer? Do I know a little bit about the composer? Is it early Beethoven? Is it late Beethoven? Those make changes. Uh, think about the broader things of what was going on in the composer's life at that time, what was going on in the world at that time. All of those things sort of inform a general uh, mm -hmm. thing. And then when you have um, chorus, then you have the text which is added. And so in almost every sense, the, the poetry that the composer has set is a lot of the inspiration behind the music. So I try to spend a lot of time with the poetry before I really delve in first, because I think that's, it's important for me to have that background because one of the great things about choruses versus orchestra is we have this added element of text. And so a lot of times we're doing things in a foreign language, so mm -hmm. sometimes it's just finding a translation that really means something. And you know, we don't want a translation necessarily that's beautiful poetry. We want a translation that, so we know that this word means this so that we can think about that. So those are kind of the, the big things. And then I look at um, the bigger macro thing. Is it a, is it a four movement symphony and what are the key relationships? Is it a, uh, a, a theme and variations with 10 variations? Just what is the, the basic kind of pillars? And then once that's kind of done, then I start going into movement by movement. And, and the movement by movement, um, um, some people do harmonic analysis straight through the movement. I get a little bored doing that, so I kind of do it by sections. But I kind of do what, uh, kind of the Julius Herford technique of of breaking um, all of these pieces into four bars, six bar statements, mm -hmm. eight bar statements. And then what happens is, um, I say it's a six bar phrase. Um, I do everything with that six bar phrase. I look at you know, what's, what's going on melodically, what's the harmony, what's the, uh, you know, all of the harmonic analysis underneath of that, what are the important things, is this a phrase that's leading to the next phrase, all of those things. And I just go and you go part by part by part. And some, like you said, there could be 35, 40 parts you have to learn, but we, I don't go on to the next six measures until I have that measures, those measures known. And I have to know, you know, is, is the percussion player playing a triangle and then switching to tambourine, everything from that to the more nuance of it. And then I think then you go to the next six bars, or the next four bars. And I think you just go slowly by slowly. And I think uh, for some people that can be very fast. For me, it takes a while. When you look at a full score of 20 or 30 parts, you say, well, do you read a full score? Well, yeah, I read a full score. But the question is not so much do you read it, but do you know what's there? Yeah. And so I think um, what happens is after, over time, you um, start to hear that score. And some people can hear that score in their mind right away. For me, it's a very slow process. And I just do it by study, study, study. But it's just, it is note by note, phrase by phrase, measure by measure. And then when I get all that done, then I go back and I step back and I look at that whole movement again with the context of what I've learned. I think the, the micro kind of influences the macro and vice versa. So that's kind of the, 
the general scope of it, but you know, to do one movement for me that could be 200 measures, you know, I might spend six hours. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of my process. How is that similar or different than yours? Um, you know, for me, I tend to, <coughs> I tend to just read the piece just straight um, before doing any sort of of what I like to call exegetical work. Um, I just I just read. I just read through the piece, um, and one of the things that I have been forcing myself to do now is to listen, because it was so it was so, you know, branded in me. Do not listen to this piece until you've <coughs> got at least three to four weeks of yep. um, of, of work under your belt, um, and I took that serious. But as a young conductor, there were some, there were there were things. You know, when I did when I did um, Mozart's Requiem, um, there were just some things about that piece that were way more complex for a young conductor to really grasp. Yep, I totally um, agree. And so <coughs> it really helped for me to go to um, one, go to. I tend to listen to two different types of recordings. Um, one that's more performance practice um, and one that's more kind of the traditional or, or have romanticized mm -hmm. things a little bit just to give myself some perspective. Um, but I will say that I tend to wait to listen to recordings um, until at least... I've gotten through some of the harmonic analysis uh, of the piece, um, and then I'll listen to some some recordings um, of the piece and and sort of find some things that really speak to me. Um, and then instead of implementing that, I figure out how to implement myself into what mm -hmm. I liked about them. <coughs> um, but I I do not. And I and I know it's bad, you know. Many con many conductors will say, "Don't ever do that." Um, but I tend to get to the, I tend to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse with my ensembles, with my harmonic analysis, everything in my score, um, and then I get to the performance and I use a clean copy, and I'll write I'll write things that I need to remember. Um, but the hope is, the hope was that I could have so much of it as a part of me um, that I wouldn't need all of those details. And when you are in school and you've got all this time and you can study and then go conduct, it works. Right. But now when you have a full-time job and you're trying to get in some score studying for professional gigs, that you're doing, meanwhile having to focus on church work and all those things, it's kind of like no, I, I now I take my, I take my, everything that I've done in my score, I take that to the performance, and it, it has saved me um, mm -hmm. a lot, but it has also hindered me some because I tend to overly, overly notate in my scores, um, and that's done me some some disservice. So. Um, Bryce asks, how do you approach <coughs> preparing to conduct a work that is new to you? Do you listen to others? Well, I, I do, actually. And I, I think, kind of going on what you were talking about, um, we all got that thing that it's a, it's a taboo to listen to a recording. But I think, I think you can listen to a recording and not imitate it. That's mm -hmm. what we don't want because there's no service yep. to you or, or that ensemble that created that. But I think um, I really like to listen to recordings on the early part of the stage, even ahead of uh, sometimes harmonic now, but I listen quite a bit at the very beginning to, like you said, a variety of, just to kind of hear different approaches. Uh, and then I kind of forget it. And then I do my study. And then I sort of go back and I put together my, uh, the way I, th I feel this piece is best interpreted through the composer's eyes. And I kind of get to that point. And then when I go back and I listen to recordings, just to see if there's something I miss, I generally know I'm ready when I hate every recording I listen to. <laughs> uh, and that generally happens because now you've, you've become so um, akin to what you think is the right approach mm -hmm. or for you. And so I think that's what's great about it. And I do go back, and I, it is true. I'll go, well, I like that, but I hate 95% of everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's just 
that's kind of the way. And for everyone, it's different. For a new piece, um, if, it's, if it's a new piece that's just new to me but not contemporary, um, I think it's really valuable to do that. And, you know, generally when we program, we listen, we either hear a live performance or we hear a recording. Yep. So that's the first time we get to know the piece. So I really like the idea of listening a little bit to start to get yourself kind of a sense of the oral sound. And what I'll do is I'm learning a piece for the, new t next, for the first time. I'll make sure, like, say it's a, a piece by Frank Tekeli. I'll listen to seven or eight or nine Tekeli pieces to get an idea of his sound world, of his, of his, his kind of thumbprint so that I can take that into this new piece. And then I think what's great now is when you can kind of do your source study, if it's a contemporary composer, in the world we live in now, I don't, you, can, you can text or email any composer and say, what were you thinking here? And they'll send you a note back. And so, and yep. you know, if you have a composer in residence, even better, but the, the ability to just reach out and say, I, you know, I see this harmonic relationship, what were you trying to do? Or even something as simple as which I've done is, is say, do you really mean an F sharp? It looks like it should be an F natural, and sometimes it's a mistake. Yeah. So those kinds of things. But I, I think it's, I don't see a problem with doing that, but I think there again, you have to put your own guardrails on and say, I'm not gonna imitate or copy a performance because that doesn't serve the music, you or your ensemble. Yeah, I, I would say for myself, <coughs> conducting a work that's new to me is, um, you know, when I did the Poulenc organ concerto um, with Craig Williams uh, from West Point, we had an extremely solid string section. I mean, just extremely solid. Um, and, you know, I will never forget just... I would spend 10 hours a week on that piece just because there were there were some things that I just I wasn't getting um, but the frustrating thing about a lot of works that are new to me um, there's not a ton of recordings there are you know with the pooling organ concerto you know YouTube brings up a few professional professional recordings mm -hmm. But other than that, it's just it's a bunch of like recordings of of someone with a handheld video camera at a church concert where the right. organist is is pretty good and the orchestra is pretty good, um, and I like that because that actually is for me is how I how I learn to like new music is is by conducting it or preparing it, um, and I I really the Poulenc organ concerto was was a piece that I really hated. Um, it was just like, this isn't really pleasing. And then you immerse yourself in it, and you just see all the texture that's in this piece. It's like, holy crap, I really, really like this piece. And in fact, it was funny, um, I did the pool link here, and our pastor's uncle, who I believe lives in Dallas, is a just a lover of all pool link. And so he flew in from Dallas just oh, to... Wow just to hear the Poulenc, um, and, you know, it's, I, I just take it as, I think with new music, I tend not to listen to any recordings, just because um, generally there's some complexity to it, um, and if I learn it wrong, it gets well, ingrained that's in that's me true. wrong. Um, and there, there, like I was saying, there's a section of the pool length that I was, I was doing wrong. And so I would sit at the piano and play it. And I was like, this isn't right. I'm trying to mimic what the recording is doing. And the recording was wrong. <laughs> and so I had to sit there and teach myself how to get this correct. Yeah, to unlearn. Um, so <laughs> by the time I got to that rehearsal and only had one three-hour rehearsal to put... Um, the Poulenc organ concerto together, and uh, the Gilmont organ symphony, which is a hard piece, it is, yeah. um, together in one three-hour rehearsal. I knew I knew what I was doing. I was prepared, and I have learned that that way of having to just learn things my without listening to the recording is I know it, and I don't even I find myself in those sections of the piece. I stop looking at the score, and exactly. when I get to a part I I need the score, I realize I you know I'm three pages <laughs> behind. Um, but that's sort of that's sort of how I approach a piece that's new to me, is I just sit there and learn each part so that I know 
and it gives me a sense of, especially with orchestral works, it gives me a sense of what the player has to do. Mm-hmm. Because the player has to learn in this piece when I need to blend in with the ensemble, when I need to speak over the ensemble. So that actually helps me. And I do the same thing with chorus. You know, I, I try and learn each part of the chorus so that I can kind of mark in my chorus, this is this is where the basses speak, this is where the altos speak, this is where the rest of the chorus needs to get out of the way because the altos are singing so low that they can't right. be heard. So that's kind of how I, I approach it. Well, I think, you know, we were talking a little bit about once you do that score study, the next thing is kind of how you mark your score in a way that's beneficial to you. And Rick Heyman, uh, one of our wonderful tenors, says, um, do you use a best practice method to mark your scores or is it custom designed? Um, I think I have a picture of my, uh, can we go to the, can we go to the fourth picture of the water, with the water bottle, and then we'll come back to this picture? Sorry. There you go. So this is, (laughs) this is my, so this is when I was preparing Mozart Requiem, and you can see, right, right there specifically, you can see the the, the blue and red, uh, but there's also a brown and a green um, color pencil that I use. But in terms of marking my score, I was preparing the Mozart Requiem. And if you look super close, you'll see some harmonic analysis going on. But I actually will sit at the piano and play um, to, to really get a harmonic progression going on. And then I mark dynamics. Um, I mark important... Um, uh, I mark important, what is the word I'm looking for? Oh, subjects or? I, oh man. Something important. I need more coffee. I, I mark, <laughs> I mark rhythms that I need to, to know. So if I'm, if it's a two plus two or three plus two, right. or it's a four, but really I need to conduct it in a two or subdivided I'll mark those things in my score just so I, I remember. Um, but I always try and mark subjects and themes. Um, and and I, mark, I mark the subjects in a way that when I return to the subject, it doesn't sound exactly the same if, if that's what I'm going for. So my, my score tends to be marked up. And there's a lot of color in my score. And that sort of comes from the Margaret Hillis um, sort of tradition of, of of score marking, but no no I don't think any conductor marks their score the same because each person each conductor knows what I need to yep, have exactly. in my score to remind me to 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 conduct the correct way here. And I think you're not I I think about like a if you're reading with a with a two or three year old that doesn't read yet but they're reading a book that they know really well. This, the, the child knows immediately when you mess up because mm-hmm. they've got it memorized. And that's kind of like um, whether you do a concert memorized or not, generally we're doing most of that memorized because we know it so well. And so a lot of times what you see in the score is sometimes designed just to kind of help you because I don't want to look and read. I want to go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And so um, I think that's one of the things that really helps. So I want to show um, a little bit of uh, s- uh, you can kind of see what a score looks like up close. So this one is... Um, just to kind of give you an idea, and I, I also like Jamal. Um, I started out on the Margaret Hillis uh, thing, and she uses a ton of colors. And I used to, d- I did that for a number of years, and then I felt like I was doing too much, too many art projects, so I went a little bit leaner. So now I only use two colors. I only use red and blue. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One of the, one of the reasons is I have dyslexia. So um, sometimes when I look at the page, it doesn't look like it's supposed to. So I do a lot of things that help my eyes focus and see things. And so, can we go back to that again? Um, so, what we want to do is, um, what I kind of do is, anything that's related to the chorus, I generally do in blue, whether it be a cueing, which looks like a parenthesis. So, if you see, like, uh, on the bottom of this page, you'll see in the tenor line, which is the third line down, you'll see just a little, a little uh, parenthesis. That just reminds me, I need to cue the tenors. Um, but sometimes I'll bracket in a blue, which means it's a subject or it's a major theme. And, of course, all the breath marks are written in. There are things like, the first thing it says in the top, it says the essence of order. I have order because that's what I'm going to have to remind the choir to do. And then I use a combination of, of red and blue. Red for louder dynamics, 
blue for small softer dynamics. And then if you notice like at the very bottom, you'll see a little squiggly line. I use this little squiggly line for um, accelerandos for retards, those kinds of things, because I can show um, if it's a really slow retard, it's a, it's a wider um, kind of squiggly. If it's a very short one, I can kind of show the shape of what I want that to be. And so I can look down quickly and go, oh, this is going to be uh, this kind of a performance. And then um, any instrumental things I cue in red. So let's go to the next slide. So this is from a full score just to give you a better idea of, of what I'm talking about. So if you look in the bottom, you'll see these blue brackets. And that's kind of like what Jamal was talking about. What those blue brackets are, are uh, in this case, it's a, it's a, a subject or a theme. So I want to be able to kind of visualize and see where those themes happen, how they interlap, how they move next to each other. And then if you'll notice, like uh, in most cases, at the very beginning, I, this is a giant score, so I couldn't get all the wins. The <laughs> first line there is a clarinet. And if you'll see, the clarinet has that theme bracketed in red. And if you look below in the soprano line in blue, they match. So that shows me that those are playing the same thematic idea. And the same thing through. And so there's just a lot of ways... Um, for me, that's very quickly. You can see in the strings, which are the middle of that page, you can just see little uh, red parentheses. That's just to remind me to cue. And sometimes I don't cue, but I know where the thematic ideas are. But realize I have to mark mine in a different way because sometimes when I go to it, it doesn't look like that, which is not awesome. Um, let's look at one more, just to give you an idea. And this one is from uh, Mendelssohn's Elijah. And this one has a lot of different things. So I use red, uh, red and blue, but I also use black or pencil, and the black or pencil I use for things that are related to how I conduct. So at in the very beginning, it has a little long little dash there with pencil, and that is a deadbeat, which means it's just saying that's that measure and allows the, the performer, uh, in this case it was Jamal, to have some freedom. And then you'll see the next big thing, um, which is a, a red marking is showing that a full, uh, with the horns, trombones, timpani, and strings come in. And then you'll notice that little word bail is circled. And you wonder, well, why is that? Well, coming out of a deadbeat, if you do a deadbeat, what I found in connecting a million measures of recitative is if I know what word to start my rebound to lift my hand up, then I'll be ready for the next thing. So I have to listen to the priest of Baal, I rebound up, and then strike, yep, ba ba. And so a lot of that you'll see where um, I've circled every time I'm doing a rebound, and that's because I can just glance and I know exactly where it is. I already know the, th I already know the melody, but it's just a matter of of seeing that. And then there are things like, is it in two, is it in four, all of those things. And so I kind of mark up my score quite a bit, but you'll notice I don't have harmonic analysis in that. And that's because when I add the harmonic analysis, at least for my situation, especially with being dyslexic, all I see is just a bunch of hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> it's better for me to sort of do it that way. So that just gives you an idea. And I think, um, you know, as many people, as, uh, connectors as they are, is as many different ways they mark the score. And I think that's where the, the real goal of marking a score is to make you effective in rehearsal and performance. So that's kind of my thought on that. Yeah, and one, one of the things that I, I do when I really have the time to, um, to study, and I did it when I, with my Beethoven 9, um, and I mean, I, I, I went to the extreme with Beethoven 9 just because it was freaking Beethoven 9 and I was right. 25 years old, um, but also... I think I was in my, I think I was in my first year of grad school when I did, when I conducted Beethoven Nine, and I went so I went so heavy one because it's it's a complex piece that takes the utmost attention. Two, the the uh, artistic director decided that we were going to do Beethoven Nine. Uh, he decided on the project four months before the concert. Ooh. So you know. Trying to learn a Beethoven 9 in four months is a lot. Um, so I will say I missed a lot of grad school within those four months just trying to <laughs> learn been, that Beethoven trying 9. Trying to be ready. But um, what I actually wound up doing was um, breaking the bound on my, my Baron Rider score mm -hmm. um, and copying every page. Um, and I would focus, I think I would focus one week on one movement, and that was it. And I would I would mark everything in that score: harmonic analysis, rhythm, um, reminding me that no, traditionally we don't do the first repeat in in, in right. the first movement. Marking all of those things, and that was what I practiced with the mirror with. That is what I studied with. And so when I knew that first movement, that's when I put into my actual score the important things that 
I will need in this performance to make me successful. Um, and I will never forget, I, I can't think of his name, his really famous pianist who just died. Um, but I went up to do a Beethoven choral fantasy with him in Massachusetts. And I left my Beethoven 9 score in Massachusetts and had a rehearsal the next day for B9. <laughs> so I had to take a Dover edition. Oh, which is like absolutely horrid. Yes. And I had to conduct But it's only 10.95. <laughs> yeah. I had to and it wasn't even like <laughs> it by itself. It was the Beethoven 9 that has like two other, but symphonies, other symphonies in it. it. Yeah. So I actually had to conduct that rehearsal. And luckily I had done my due diligence and had the stuff in my head and luckily someone had grabbed my score and brought it with him. Um, so I could get it from them at school the next day. But, uh, you know, that was my sort of my process with Beethoven 9. And the great thing about so much of these, with Baron Ryder, with so much of their orchestral literature, um, you can get the piano editions right. of, these, of these symphonies. And I am in no way a, you know, virtuosic pianist. But I'm I'm a good I'm a good keyboardist, and so I have I that's a lot of what I did was was just playing through these movements, taking taking measures at a time, playing through them, finding out what the harmonies were, um, and then looking at this looking at the score to to say okay this instrument's doing this here, um, so that's how I actually approached Beethoven nine was was which is actually, I think, how I approach most of my score studying is completely at the keyboard. So do you find it debilitating in the score study process not to be an extremely strong keyboardist? Oh, or do yes. Do you find it... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But I still... But I still uh, that's essentially how I learn, too, is I sit yeah. there at the keyboard, and, you know, it just it's going to be a lot slower when I play it than you. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, what are what are some of your main considerations when putting together a seating chart for your ensembles? How much do you consider individual voices and how they work? Are their considerations different depending on the size of the ensemble? And this was from Mark Waxstrom. We like Mark. He's one of our one of our base section leaders. He is one of one of the best. He is awesome. Well, I uh, for me, I do. Uh, I think throughout my life, it's evolved a lot. But I do a lot, especially with choirs. The vocal placement has, you can make so many changes that changes everything. But if I were going to say, what's the basic philosophy? I divide um, singers into four categories. They are the leaders. The leader is generally like you, a section leader who has great musicality, has, you know they're going to know their part. They're a strong voice. So those are the, those are the, the leaders, or sorry, the, yeah, the leaders. And then the drivers. A driver is essentially a, a big voice, um, may or may not be, um, the best musician, but these are voices that um, are going to be very strong. Generally, I, what I call a driver is someone that's going to know their part, pretty musical. Then we have the blenders. The blenders are generally small to medium-sized voices that have a pleasant sound. They're musical. And then we have the leaners, and the leaners can be a leaner in a variety of ways. It could be a really good voice that maybe um, is not the best sight reader. Mm -hmm. It could be a, a, a person that maybe doesn't have the greatest voice or someone who is maybe new to an organization that you want to kind of foster them along. And so I have those kind of four categories. And so what I do when I set up the section, and I do a section by section, and the idea is I want my leaders uh, and my drivers kind of spread out to sort of be almost like a triangle or kind of like the, the column of the sound. And so by using the right combination of the drivers and the leaders, I get what I consider the sound that I'm after. And then I put the, b the blenders in around that. Um, and the great thing, if you have two driver voices, um, you put two drivers together, it's not going to be good for either one of them. Mm -hmm. But I put, if I put a blender uh, between each one of them on each side, all of a sudden now I'm, we're able to create the sound and voices are working together and those drivers are doing really good things for the blenders and the blenders are doing really good mm -hmm. things for the drivers. And then the leaners, you just find the spots where they need to be. But I kind of do that with each section and uh, with the idea that the center part of the section is the core of the sound for every voice part. And then you have the other thing about going, well, where are the sopranos, where are the tenors, where are the basses? And you'd be surprised just by moving one section from one place to the other, it creates a totally different sound. So I, 
I kind of use that system and it's always worked well for me. And then along with that, um, a lot of people say, I wish we'd sing more mixed, which is great for the singer. And I love singing mixed. I don't do enough of it. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm always reluctant to do that is I want to be able to communicate with every section. Yeah. And um, when I'm working with a mixed ensemble, I lose that ability to communicate with a section yeah. because now the section is everywhere. So that's kind of the way I sort of approach it. What's your approach with scene? Um, I definitely am a... I, you know, I was, I was fast hard at um, SA... B T. Right. That was kind of always my fast approach, um, just because I, I liked building the chorus in that way, um, and sort of having those those inner voices together and mm -hmm. those outer voices right next to each other. Um, but then throughout grad school, I I really got into the S A T B and just kind of going that way. Um, and that I have really grown to enjoy just because I know where my sections are. Um, but it kind of creates this enclave of sound where you know your, your, your outer voices are really sitting on the out, outer mm -hmm. parts of the chorus and your inner voices are together. Um, and there's, there's always so much work you have to do with those inner voices. Um, but I, I generally try to keep, if I, have, if I have a lot of drivers and a lot of leaners, I, I tend to, to sort of make sure that the bulk of my drivers are in the back of each exactly, section. Exactly, yeah, I assume. Um, just because I, I'd rather that sound go over and there's some ability to mix sound versus my leaners just getting completely um, left behind because a lot of times, you know, I think about one of the, when I was doing the Mozart Requiem, um, the Salvame, um, that actually was a portion of, of the Requiem that I depended on my leaners for mm -hmm. because it was the leaners that had the, the smaller kind of crystal clear voices that are okay without vibrato. So in that moment, my, my drivers who had these big voices became the leaners, because I'm just like, I need you for, for just these eight measures of solve a to just not use any vibrato whatso whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I just want a clear, clear, pure sound. Um, so I, I really tend to... And, and I come from a tradition of, um, and I think that's why so much of Key Carell is new for me and other things is because I don't come from the Midwestern tradition of, mm -hmm. of, of choral singing. I come from the New York tradition of choral singing where everything is, you know, if you don't have an opera chorus singing or that sort of sound, then you don't have a chorus. Um, and so learning the complexities of, of that Midwestern tradition of, of choral singing um, has become very new to me um, because when I was in New York City, everything had to be a fat sound. I mm -hmm. mean, you, you could have, you know, 20 Mark Wackstroms and 20 Jamals um, in, your, in your bass section and, and 20 Rob Davises, you know, kind of that, right. that big sound. Um, and solve a just was never, you know, in the Mozart Requiem was it just it didn't get what I wanted because everyone had a hard time turning off the the big rich rich sound. So I would say Key Carell has definitely sort of, um, and even being in, in church ministry has sort of changed my approach to. Um, how to how to voice the choir very very well because I was in New York City all of my church choirs were all pro heavy singers right so um, I would definitely say being here has has helped ev helped me evolve in how I put to put together a chorus um, but I I just I I just like making sure that the bulk of my drivers are always in the back of the section. Um, 
because just having that force of sound, but knowing that somehow it'll mix together with those who are leaning on them. And so. it, yeah, and it gives them more confidence because they're hearing the sound behind them. And I think mm -hmm. the other thing that you have to do is, no matter what you do on paper, that's great. But then you listen, you go, you know, that didn't work. This did work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's amazing in a rehearsal, you can move one, two, three or four people uh, out, of, uh, out of 50 or 60 and it makes a big change. And so it's, so many times it's just really listening and being aware. And, and you know, a lot of times there'll be two singers that you think in your mind are going to work together and you go, it's just not going to work together. And then, of course, you have the politics is, are they seven foot next to a four foot person yeah. and do they each irritate each other? So there's those <laughs> things too. So do you want to talk about maybe interpretation a bit, maybe? Yeah, let's, let's, let's kind of talk about, um, and I do want to answer this question oh, go, that on, on programming. Um, what is your favorite genre to conduct? Ah, all right. I do want to ask you that question. Oh, darn, are you asking me now? I am. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> I, that's a tough one. I think I would have to go to... Uh, what I really like the most to conduct is Mozart, early Beethoven, Haydn, which you love, um, <laughs> a lot of that. So I, I really love that style, and it just it just fe it feels in my body. Um, it just seem, seems to come so naturally. So I think if my favorite genre is probably going to be um, you know that time of Mozart, and I just I, I I probably connected almost every choral work of Mozart, and I'll do it again. Mm -hmm. How about you? I would say uh, Beethoven, late Beethoven. Um, and, and much of the bel canto repertoire, that just is, that's who I am. And I, I have a video of, uh, of, a, of, of my favorite early piece. It's, it's one of my favorite pieces to conduct. Do we have that video? Oh, here we go. He looks good. So you'll 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 sort of notice from that video that's forty highly trained exactly. singers, and so my interpretation of that is going to be drastically different than working with um, like our chamber singers, and you know with that ensemble it's it's literally forty something highly trained musicians who are singing in opera choruses and things like that. So it's a bit more, you know, pesante, a bit more heavy yep. of, of a sound that traditionally a performance practice would kind of look down on. But it's just that was that was the interpretation I think that best fit that chorus. Um, and then after that, I conducted a Mendelssohn, um, a Mendelssohn cantata. But I would say any bel canto repertoire, Rossini, Verdi. Um, just anything like that is just comes naturally to me just because I love the drama. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was talking about earlier the, the Gilmont Organ Symphony. Um, you get to that last movement, and I mean, the low brass section, you know, you just, you just give, this, give this gesture to them, and I mean, they're just wailing the heck away just bringing i mean making the making the room shake um and so i think any any i think most of that sort of repertoire i feel like i can kind of be myself and bring myself mm -hmm. to the music versus a lot of earlier repertoire as much as i love it um i feel like i actually have to kind of hone my personality in and and bring uh, a more pure, pure sound. So before we move on, I have one more question. Uh-oh. Is there a piece of music that you have yet to conduct that is your dream piece? 
That's a good question. I have quite a few in that list, but I'm going to go, uh, I, I would think, I think the Britain War Requiem, which we've talked about before. It's one of my uh, bucket list pieces because it's, um, I'm one of those people, the more variables are, the more engaged I am. Mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, there's a children's chorus, a full chorus, there's two different orchestras, um, just a lot of stuff. And I love, um, um, you know, the message of this piece about being, about uh, understanding the, the, the tragedy of war and trying to do everything we can to prevent that. So I, the message is very strong, but it's one of those pieces, um, it's, it's very complex uh, from a connecting standpoint, and that's what I love about my job is I'm always being challenged mm -hmm. by the next repertoire. So I know that piece would challenge me, keep me up at late at night, and I would be a better connector after it. What about you? Um, there's only one, p well, I shouldn't say that. There are so many pieces out there that are, are dreams, but I would say there's a top two list, um, and number one on that list, which I'm pretty sure is number one on every conductor's list, is Mahler's Eighth Symphony. <laughs> um, yes, I would agree. It's, it is, it is to me, Verdi Requiem on steroids. I would, yeah, that's um, a good way to describe I it. I mean, there is not one instrument that you can think of that is not in Mahler's Eighth on top of this huge chorus and then the need for the plethora of soloists right um and so that is i mean the people who have gotten to conduct that and i think bernstein's recording is one of my yep, my, one favorites of my favorites well. i think my least favorite recording of that i've ever seen and heard was due to mel's but i don't know um, that one you know i i would i i would love to see ricardo muti uh, <laughs> Ricardo Muti, <laughs> I'd love to see him do this before he retires. I mean, he's 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 the king of the Verdi Requiem, but I'd love to see him do a Mahler's Eighth Symphony before he retires or or dies. I just that piece has everything I love in it. Well, I think we're kind of wrapping up here. We do have some very. Uh, I think we should move ahead to the funny stories. If you're yeah, right. yeah, we have a, a question from Lisa Fugchustix who says. Uh, uh, describe the most hilarious slash frightening moment when a performance you were involved in as a student or conductor started going off the rails, Ooh, <laughs> but miraculously recovered and ended up being a beautiful performance and how the experience of losing control and bouncing back has affected how you approach your craft today. Woo, that's loaded. Well, I would say once was uh, my first Handel's Messiah with, was my first, Handel's Messiah was my first professional gig. Uh, in Chicago, and I had members of Chicago Symphony, really good chorus, um, and I was running a 103 degree fever. Oh my! The day of the performance, and I had to get up there, and I was just sweating like a pig. I was, I mean, I'm in full tails and everything, sweating like a pig, and we get to end the glory of the Lord, and. I had rehearsed it in one. Everybody was prepared for one. And we started it in one, and I just noticed I'm getting dizzier <laughs> and dizzier <laughs> and dizzier. So luckily I had the railing, and I'm holding on to the railing, and the choir, or a long way to go. The choir and orchestra <laughs> literally just took care of themselves. Like, I'm beating in three, you know, because I don't know where I am. They're all still going in one. And, <laughs> and so finally, s someone from the stage crew goes back and gets me a stool with a, with a back on it. And I, I had to conduct the rest of that concert sitting in a stool, not really knowing where I was. <laughs> uh, and that was... Nothing really went off the rails except for me. That was that was the most frightening frightening thing I'd ever done was my first professional conducting gig. I'm running a high fever and am about to pass out. That's a good one. I, I Michelle and I were talking about this like what would you talk about of that? I I said and I was like, we, we'll just talk about the last one. That's because <laughs> it's more in your mind. Because it just, it always, it, it, these things happen in live performance. And I know the last one that, I, that struck me was I was uh, connecting the Venice Symphony um, uh, and the Cuban Ballet School doing their Nutcracker. 
And uh, as typically with Nutcracker, it's a really long piece, it's really complex, and you never have enough rehearsal time. So we're trying to get all of this music learned, and the first act of uh, the Nutcracker is dece deceptively hard. Mm -hmm. A lot of changes, and there was this one spot that we talked about, and we said, we're going to do it in four. And everyone said yes. And I said, make sure we're going to do this in four, not in two. We had done it in two. We said, no, we're going to agree. We're going to do it in four. So here we are at the second performance. No, the first performance. We're at the first performance, and we're getting close to that moment. And you could just see in the orchestra, they were going, is it in two or is it in four? And I'm, we were coming up, and I thought, uh-oh. I, I almost said before we started, I almost said, remember, it's in four. So I conducted in four, and some went in four, and some went in two, Ooh. and then it, and the dancers are dancing, they're doing their thing, and I'm like, this is about to be a work stoppage. This is about to absolutely crash and burn. And, I, and so when I'm, when, those, when I'm in those instances, I look around, I go, who is watching? And I went, okay, you. I said, we're in four. He goes, I, I just go, and he goes, yep. And we just, we kind of kept going, and I just kept, I kept conducting like this. Hey, everybody, remember when we talked about it was going to be in four? And they all kind of eventually came together, but there was a cacophony that was easily 30 seconds, which if I was a dancer, I would look down in the pit and go, what are you doing down there? Uh, and we made it through that, and I can tell you that um, it was only about six, eight bars, but I thought for certain we were going to start again, and I don't think that's a good thing in a ballet. You so remember, that was you, mine. You remember, <laughs> my, you remember my Beethoven piano concert number five? I do. Uh, <laughs> and the pianist gets lost and I'm pretty sure just starts vamping <laughs> and I'm just you know it's p keeping an orchestra together is hard regardless but keeping a accompanying orchestra to a soloist is like it's hard okay. so the accompanist I don't know what's happening so I'm just like I'm just like that's when that's when you forget all the fancy stuff you do and you're just here and you you make some sort of <laughs> gesture to get the orchestra to lock eyes with you. So I'm mimicking, you know, measure numbers. Right. That, and I'm like, okay, in three beats, we're going to be on the downbeat of this measure. And luckily, I was able to save the, save the performance from going off the rails. But I just was like, man, that's, that's tricky to do. So I think we've got some embarrassing, embarrassing photos. We to do. Talk we do have some embarrassing photos. Who's, who's first? Let's I see. I think you're first. Oh, my. Oh, shoot. Oh, very nice. This is <laughs> what Michelle and I effectively call the helmet hair. Um, <laughs> that was ah! back when I had hair, and it, it took a lot of product to get that sort of helmety shape to it. But I embraced it with a baton and without. So you can see the, the helmet hair lasted a while. Um, so I, I think that looks like the, the one with the, the tie looks like I'm, I'm ready to do my first day of <laughs> high school teaching. The next one looks like he's a young conductor. He doesn't know what he's about to do. <laughs> and then uh, what's the next one? Oh, oh see, there yes. you go. You got <laughs> to have your publicity photos. And this is the, this, oh, that's very fierce. <laughs> 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 that's so that, That's good. That's the look. Uh, so that's, the, that's sort of the connecting look. You know, you want that little... <laughs> that little fierce look and you know that's the beauty of of pr shots back in the, back in the day you really got some crappy <laughs> ones all right so this is i thought oh. i was very sexy just out oh, in look the at that in the tree <laughs> out in the woods <laughs> you know i was like man this is a great uh this is a great this is a great cover photo for me that you know for it my is. cd or for my next nice. conducting gig what's the what's the next one? <laughs> oh. oh. I don't even know. Are we? Are you in Les Mis? What's I going am, on? I am in. I think I'm singing. I think this is Johnny Skeeky. Oh, it's wow. either Skeeky or I'm doing the role of Eisenstein in Deflator Mouse. But it was the first time I'd ever worn a blonde wig. That's a very long wig. <laughs> and then there's this creepy face. Oh, <laughs> why is there? A, why is there? <laughs> it's, that That's just, my favorite. Oh wow! <laughs> so, so this one was supposed to be. <laughs> this, this I was I flipped my score two pages, so I was getting ready for this major downbeat, and the choir just went to this soft piano. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I don't know what that face. But I uh, it's, it's like one of it's my almost like a, it's almost like I don't know the mannequin. There's a mannequin <laughs> on, at the organ playing or something. What's the next one? Yeah. Oh, see, I people probably don't know this, and I'm I'm sad to say it now, but I spent a lot of time in barbershop quartets and barbershop courses. In fact, I was actually one of the one of the better <laughs> conductors. But I had a lot of quartets, 
And uh, this one was just, they, obviously we were very uncool being cool, <laughs> as you can tell. These guys, they were ready to go to war, and we, as you can tell, we're all so happy to be in World War I. We did like a World War I package for contests, and I think what's great about this is never have four guys been so happy to be in World War I. <laughs> Uh, this looks like a, a guys who won a bowling uh, event. <laughs> we got our bowling shirts. This is my uh, the the year we won our our competition to go to international competition. These are four of my buddies uh, with a giant uh, bowling trophy. Uh, we were excited about that. Everyone looks younger and thinner there. There's some great hair going on. Oh, there is. This is uh, one of my uh, group called the West Towns Chorus, which is a uh, about a hundred and twenty wow. voice uh, barbershop chorus. And we did this crazy package at International with guys in zoot suits. And we had uh, people dancing on bar tables and throwing money in the air and a speakeasy. And I don't think ever again has there ever been a, a barbershop chorus that sang an international competition, Is You Is or Is You Ain't My Baby. But that's Whoa. what we did. Oh, here we are. Oh, with Kenny Rogers. He looks the same then as he did 20 years from now and 20 yeah. years before that. But uh, this is <laughs> singing with Kenny Rogers and connecting there. This is my buddy, uh, Leoma Lovegrove, who's a great Florida artist. And we, uh, she, we did this for a photo shoot for a group called Vocal Artistry that I conducted. Oh, nice. And uh, she, you know, I, I can't compete with those glasses. Yeah, that's those pretty. Those are pretty awesome. Those, those are, are signature are. glasses. Uh, this is, uh, the <laughs> I conducted uh, with the Southwest Florida Symphony, the Holiday Pops every year. And this is what we call Gay Santa Joe. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this, I, I, I really didn't have a love of sparkles, but I apparently I, as I get older, I like them. And so this is, this is my regular gig now when I get to be a ringmaster uh, for the uh, Cirque du Bois, and I got my epaulets and my shiny bling. This year when we do Cirque du Bois, I've got red shiny shoes yeah. like Dorothy. Yeah. Ooh, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> and I think maybe one more. Uh, this is actually uh, at Chamonix in France um, after a... After a uh, uh, performance and, and you can't quite tell from that but that beer is is at least the size of me <laughs> <laughs> so those are my embarrassing photos uh, do you have any more embarrassing photos to I show? i don't think so wow so we're going to end with the beer photo we're going like to end that. with the beer photo well i have to tell you this uh believe it or not wraps up this edition of morning coffee and maestros and we want to thank all of you for joining us today and for those who have been with us since we started the program back in june we extend our gratitude for being part of these conversations it's hard to believe this is our ninth episode. It is. Woo! It is. And it's been great fun to connect with each and every one of you uh, every other Friday. But I'm sad to say we're about to take a little move on to a hiatus because I'm going crazy out of my mind busy, and I know you are. Yeah. And so we're going to take a little hiatus. So we appreciate you being with us, but we're going to take a little break. And the good news is that all nine episodes will be available on Key Corral's YouTube channel to watch again or catch up on any you have missed. And... And what great conversations we have been having, um, you know, when, when we go back, when we think back to the first episode, you know, I never imagined that it would have unfolded into so many good, good conversations. I agree, I agree. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, that is, that is the heart of Key Corral, is, is having conversations, exploring music, and giving back to the community, um, I've never been part of a musical organization that is that is community minded. And so we would just ask if you if you are enjoying all of these things that you have seen and have um, and you have personally benefited by, please consider donating to Key Corrales. We would love to be able to keep making an impact on the arts community, not just here in Sarasota, but the arts community around the world, because they need what we are doing um, and, and, and Key Corral has truly been a beacon of hope and light to many who have not been able to experience music and have these conversations. And we, uh, we hope you'll consider being a season subscriber or at least checking out a few of our concerts and events this season. Every event we do this year will have an online option, so whether you're here in Venice or Sarasota or Bradenton or anywhere in the country, you can experience the transformative power of music with Key Corral. Our first concert, as a reminder, premieres uh, October 30th, and it'll blast uh, until uh, November uh, 22nd. So please visit keycorral.org to learn more. So I guess for now on hiatus, for one last time, thanks for joining us on Morning Coffee. And Maestros. So I think I have to ask you, the socks. <laughs> I don't know that the socks go with a dashiki. They're kind of clashing. They do not. They, they do not. I mean, there's black and gray in it, but they do not go with the dashiki. That's true, but there's not pink in the dashiki. The dashiki's got no, the orange and the yellow. It and does. The, 
and it's a beautiful, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, and the t-shirt, I don't know, it's just a whole thing.